something violent. You heard the president! Light him up! How many balloons do you think it takes the DreamWorks Fisher Kid to get to the crescent of the moon? Five? No, let's do six. Seven, said Carol. Eight, Bill Paxton said while walking through the lawn. There was a pause, and then Gary said the unthinkable. Nine, he bellowed. The studio heads were stunned. It hadn't been done. What caused the film to burn? Look, I worked 35 millimeter projection from 1993 to 2012, and never once did I have film burn because of an alien invasion. Okay, and your point is what exactly? I mean, you're sending an animated kids movie for something it did in the opening logo sequence. Who finds this shit entertaining? Seriously? You have to be brain dead to enjoy this shit. Opening your movie with an object from space making its way to Earth cliche. Nice try, but that's not a cliche. HBO's pre-promotion of Westworld 10 years before it would debut is completely out of hand. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. Reason number 473, not to use 3D as a gimmick in your film. No one watching your movie a decade later will understand why we are spending five seconds watching a paddle ball come at the screen. It's called establishing the setting and character, Jeremy. By showing this dude lazily using a paddle ball, the movie's conveying how boring this post is. Also, we're supposed to believe this guy cooked a juicy hamburger, set it on the desk, and then wanted to create a a visual representation of how bored he was. Wait, so you understand that this shows how boring the post is? Then why did you keep the previous sin? How many times do I have to tell you this? UFOs don't exist. Except they do, because UFO doesn't mean alien spaceship. It simply means something unidentified that is flying. Jerry. F***ing Jerry. Yes, but he obviously only meant alien spaceship in this context. I don't care if you want to tell me that this is all meant as a joke or some shit. It's stupid either way. No one ever told us what to do. The only reason I took the job is because you never have to do anything! Hilarious, but you also decided to go to freaking Antarctica. There are so many other jobs that don't require snuggling up to one of the Earth's ass poles, where you can do just as much nothing as this. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. Also, yeah, you're right. But so what? All he said was that he took the job so that he never has to do anything. Your sin doesn't challenge or debunk what he said in any way, so it's just a waste of time. For a perfect day to marry Susan Murphy. So wait, did Susan's friends break into her house just so that she would see her husband mention their wedding at 5 a.m.? Why didn't he just tell her to make sure she watched? Yes, her friends did sneak into her house to make her watch this. The implication is that he didn't tell her he would mention the wedding on air because he wanted it to be a surprise, which is why he had her friends wake her up for it. Wedding starts in 30 minutes! 30 minutes? But Susan just got here, and there was nobody in the parking lot. There was no passage of time because she and her father were crying as he escorted her inside the church. And they're still doing that in the next scene. Also, the bride arrived 30 minutes before the ceremony. Movie doesn't know how to wedding. Yeah, this is all actually valid. Look, this movie is a lot of fun because of how unhinged it is, so I don't think I'm going to get many more chances to remove sins. The Weatherman and the weatherman's wife. Somewhere in the distance, Nicolas Cage's ears just perked up at the possibility of a Weatherman sequel, and I will always sin the perking up of Cage ears. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. Ah, oh, honey, my fingers are crossed. How is Susan surprised by this? Is this the first time she's spending with her future in-law? I mean, maybe. That's not exactly unrealistic, especially considering this lady is the in-law we're talking about. Derek probably just didn't want her to meet Susan before the wedding. Also, what's up with the thumb shaming? Were we still okay with disfigurement humor in 2009? Well, yeah. Comedy is just about the only thing where it's okay to make fun of people. A lot of comedy comes from dark places, as it can often help people cope with their own issues. Don't give me some shit about this being offensive, just grow up and deal with it. Besides, isn't Jeremy the same guy who said that Emma Watson was hot when she was 11? Is this church near Stonehenge or something? You have to go on a major pilgrimage to find this place. Hell, even Stonehenge has roads going by it. Everything wrong with monsters versus aliens, ladies and gentlemen. The church is in a remote location. So what? <sighs> Can we just replay what Reese and Pieces here thought the sound a human would make while getting hit by an asteroid would be? <laughs> Do it again! <laughs> More! <laughs> <laughs> Voice acting. That's the joke. Also, that fake ass laugh. Also, how do we turn our protagonist into a giant? Well, you have a meteor slam into her, as opposed to just being exposed to radiation, like the kids in Chronicle. That's a long way of saying she survives this. Yes, because of the element in the asteroid. Why are you not paying attention? 
Also, yet another pop culture reference. Apparently the role of today's wedding pianist will be played by Voldemort's mom. Okay, that was actually pretty funny. How the hell did they get all those mud stains out? Well, when she arrived, there was 30 minutes until the wedding. You couldn't clean those stains out even in 30 minutes, much less the time she had after getting hit by the meteor. Jeremy, you're watching an animated kids movie about a woman turning into a giant after getting hit by a meteor. The fact that they cleaned off the dress quickly is realistic compared to everything else. Susan's wedding dress manages to stay intact during her transformation. And look, it's not like I want to see cartoon nudity. I mean, you want to see cartoon nudity. I'm just asking for some creativity in keeping with the known laws of fabric elasticity. At the very least, just have the dress grow with her since she was wearing it when she got struck. Wait, what? Did he just claim that the dress didn't grow with her? That's literally exactly what is doing in this scene. What the hell? Why are they trying to capture Bridezilla like this? She is still a human being, right? You could just actually talk to her. Even if they don't, they don't even try. Which is kind of the point that the movie makes itself? These dudes don't care about the monsters, they just see them as wild creatures. Pay attention. Boy, this Monster Hunter Task Force sure came prepared for this exact situation, with all the personnel and materials needed to specifically subdue a human giant. Setting aside how they even knew they'd be dealing with Fiancé the Giant here, how did they know anyone would even be struck in the first place? Dude, the scene in Antarctica was when they first realized that a meteor was going to hit Earth. From there, we can safely assume that they calculated where it would land, and the monster agency presumably brought a variety of equipment to deal with any potential situation. Now, if you don't like that explanation, then there's also this. It's a kid's movie, doofus. Can we talk about the mechanics of this monster prison? An elevator cage system didn't even make sense in Cabin in the Woods, let alone here when there are only five creatures to contain. Why not? Where's your evidence? What's your reasoning? Oh, you don't have any? Okay, so why do you expect me to just accept this assertion? Oh, it's because your fanboys would just blindly agree with anything you say. Kind of like a religion. Also, another pop culture reference. Stop! This is clearly his fault. I mean, who walks into a room doing horror movie tropes like this one and expects not to get hit by a spoon? That's the point, genius. This is a mad scientist who clearly doesn't understand social norms and etiquette. I forgot how to breathe! Don't know how to breathe! Well, they finally did it. They made a character that is literally too dumb to breathe. And if that's the case, I don't even know how they make codes and sentences. Bob is basically the DreamWorks version of Meatwad. Kids movie. Not supposed to be taken seriously. Also, can you please stop with the stupid pop culture references? They're exhausting. People scream when they see you coming. Did you pull out in time? Jeremy makes a cringy sexual joke that isn't funny, cliche. Name is General W.R. Monger. We should be asking questions, hard questions, about what DreamWorks did with Subtlety's bullet-ridden body when they decided to make these animated features. Would naming him Warren have been too subtle for you, DreamWorks? Why are you watching an animated kids movie with the expectation that it's going to be subtle? This isn't fucking Ozark, my guy. Do you see Dell snooping around anywhere? Where the fuck is Garcia? I don't know. Ah, fuck you! Whoops, my bad. Seven. Eight. Character lifting weights lies about the number of lifts he's done to impress people cliche. Nope, not a cliche. Oh, and uh, one other thing. The government has changed your name to Ginormica. Was there any reason why she just went through that tour? She already met the other monsters. So why did they go through all that trouble just to tell her, the government keeps monsters secret, and now we consider you a monster. And you won't be able to see your family again. It's not like she had to go through the tour to get to her cell since all the other monsters came in through the back door of their cells to eat lunch. Right, but think of it as a sort of orientation process. They wanted to familiarize her with her new home. Why does Ginormica's cell have a solid door here, when all the other cells are glass walls on this side? Is the movie prioritizing a series of lame jokes over logical consistency? Ginormica is, you guessed it, ginormous, meaning that she now has a natural strength well beyond that of a normal human. She could easily break a glass wall is what I'm saying. Earlier, when Jim Nasty and his girlfriend walked up to this thing, they were eye level while standing on the ground. So why is it now hundreds of feet in the air? Because it rose up? The original impact probably had it a lot deeper in the ground. This design is 100% Stuart the Minion, and that just seems despicable to me. Dude, these pop culture references aren't entertaining or funny or whatever you think they are. They're just boring and a waste of time. Also, as soon as he clears the door, we see many other people in here. So are we to assume each and every one of them has to do an asshole scan before entry? Speaking of which, asshole scan before entry is what I used to tell my- Jeremy makes a cringy sexual joke that isn't funny, cliche. Also, yes, they all did that scan, but the sin is what exactly? All you did was ask a pointless question, so now I'm just confused. Then which button gets me a latte? That would be the other one, sir. What idiot designed this thing? You did, sir. Way too many characters were written with the Seth Rogen Jelly Monster character template in this movie. But that's kind of the movie's charm. 
It's completely unhinged and it isn't supposed to make any logical sense. Just roll a joint and turn your brain off, man. We need a Hail Mary pass. We need raw power. We need... Monsters. I understand where Monger is coming from, but after the military blasted the robot with all the firepower they have, what does he expect monsters to be able to do? He's expecting the monsters to be able to do what the military can't do and find a weakness to exploit. Besides, he obviously sees them as disposable. Over the last 50 years, I have captured monsters on the rampage! In 50 years, all you've caught are four monsters? I'm of the opinion that if monsters exist, you'd have run into way more than four and an extremely tall Reese Witherspoon. Why? Where's your evidence? Again, you have nothing to back up this claim. It's just a completely random contradiction of the movie in order to force another sin out of it. We already have an alien problem, General. I don't think we need a monster problem, too. Also, the movie shamefully inspires Suicide Squad. Jesus Christ, enough with the pop culture references already. Is the Earth gotten warmer? That'd be great to know that. That'd be a very convenient truth. I mean, they're stretching for a joke, and then they're stretching so far for a joke that even Helen Parr and Reed Richards are giving you side eye. But this joke was pretty funny. What's your issue with it? Okay, maybe you don't subjectively find it funny, but that's still not a sin of the movie, seeing as your opinion is basically worth jack shit based on your track record. Does anybody have a 20 on Insectosaurus? Seriously, they left at the exact same time. Gil Arnett would be excellent at CinemaSyn. Yes, they left at the same time, but Insectosaurus was walking, and we already saw how slow he is. Just watch the movie, dude, it's really not that hard. He's even in a movie where characters are 50 feet and taller. They can't resist putting a rooftop running scene in the action. Okay... And that's a sin because... Oh, you're not gonna back this up with literally anything? Okay, cool. Can someone tell me why an intelligence smart enough to travel the distance of space would design a robot this clunky and lumbering? What is this, a Star Wars movie? Yet another stupid pop culture reference. Cars should not work as skates, unless Mega Roller Girl has a way to put it in neutral and not destroy the suspension and axles with their weight. These cars would trip her up, not give her an advantage. And of course, it's cartoon physics in a ridiculous cartoon movie, but welcome to the channel, first time. I love this. He tries to justify the sin by just saying, that's what we do here, suck it up. But he's completely ignoring the fact that these kinds of sins are just boring and stupid. It's not entertaining to watch someone complain about cartoon physics. So this little shrug off defense is really dumb. Why the f is giant Reese skating toward the Golden Gate Bridge? Oh, I know. It's because of the Golden Gate Bridge is in some sort of trouble cliche. Not a cliche. Ah! Deus Ex Mothraca? Jeremy still doesn't know what a Deus Ex Machina is. We have to get these people off the bridge! Wait, so everybody hasn't gotten off the bridge yet? That almost certainly means some people have died horrible deaths. But this movie would have you believe that none of these cars eaten by the robot or smashed or fell into the water had anyone in them. But the movie never says that. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Kevin-based life form, locally known as Susan, is now too strong. I'm kind of wondering how the alien spaceship knows her name is Susan, but I'm even more wondering why the spaceship isn't referring to her as Ginormica, since the government changed her name to that. Animated kids movie. Not supposed to make sense. You'll think the new Susan is the cat's meow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, can we please put a moratorium on saying I'm sorry after every joke like this? Cockroach did it earlier when Susan told him not to do the maniacal laugh. <laughs> sorry. And right after Susan told Monger that she wasn't a threat to anyone and smashed a helicopter. Sorry. But what's the issue with it? Seriously, he just says this thing is bad and then doesn't actually provide any reason or logic. I might even agree with him if he did. But he doesn't, so I can't just blindly accept an assertion. Okay, I have a nagging question about her ID number, 00005. First, congrats on the optimism of thinking you will someday have 10,000 monsters and need all those digits. But second, and more importantly, since we learned about the Invisible Man dying, shouldn't she technically be 00006? That's actually a good catch. Well done. I love you! I love this man! No, Bob! That's my mother! They're suffocating her! Why isn't she dissolving? We saw a wayward ham simply get lodged into his body earlier and it instantly went down like an Alka-Seltzer. Kids movie. Cartoon. Way to cut up a rug, Insecto! The way Insectosaurus just appears or disappears, as the joke requires, is the same nonsense Sony does with Bigfoot in the Hotel Transylvania movie. Jesus Christ, another pop culture reference. All right, everyone just stay calm. Weren't they basically cool with the monsters this afternoon? When did they adopt the we need to hide from them strategy? They were absolutely not cool with the monsters earlier. They were very clearly uncomfortable. Mm, oh my god, stop fucking lying. Just don't see how I can have that with you. 
Derek, who has been nothing but a one-note dick this whole movie, is probably right. But someone who doesn't want to find creative ways to have sex with a woman this tall is a terrible person in my book. Jeremy sins something he agrees with cliché? Or maybe this could count as a cringy sexual joke that isn't funny cliché. Eh, who knows, just throw five sins up and move on. I know you're upset, Susan, but... What a dick move to possibly crush someone's property so you can take a load off to mope harder. Jeremy is struggling to find legit sins so badly that he's now sinning a giant for doing some property damage. In a kid's movie. The next two sins in a row are both Jeremy sinning an animated kid's movie for being an animated kid's movie. That's what this is all about? Him getting the unobtainium or whatever out of your body? Yes, that appears to be correct. Even though we're over an hour in and really have no clue how it relates to anything. I mean, we know that it makes you super powerful and this guy wants as much power as he can get. Sure, it's simplistic, but this is a kid's movie. I know I sound like a broken record, but tch, it's CinemaSins' fault. Many Zentons ago, when I was but a squidling. Alien speaks English for everything, but to make him sound properly alien, he has to refer to a passage of time as a Zenton for some reason. Jeremy points things out on the screen, cliche. General, it's targeting us. That's the idea, Lieutenant. Hold your course. Either this guy didn't know what the plan was this deep into the plan, or Monger didn't tell him. Hey, that's two in a row. The problem with writing an army of clones into your plot is that you begin to look like every other movie that has a clone army in it, thereby becoming a... something of other movies. What? So having a clone army is now wrong because there are other movies with clone armies? What the hell? By that logic, having a main protagonist and antagonist is also a sin because a lot of other movies have those too. But I'm not a monster anymore. I'm just me. Well, except the white hair state. Anyone care to explain why everything else changed back but her hair went rogue for some reason? Who the fuck cares? Monsters! Monsters! This stupid plan, by which the monsters pretended to be clones, managed to trick not only Galaxar, but his computer as well. Jeremy double dips cliche. And of course it's a game of my dancing monsters that will bring this ship down because, oh, I give up. At this point I'm half expecting the writer credit on this monstrosity of a plot to end up being Mad Libs. But isn't that the entire point? Like I said before, the charm of this movie is that it's completely random and idiotic. That's why it's so much fun. Ship has been set to self-destruct. I can't think of one good reason why alien ships always have a self-destruct mode. And don't tell me something like Star Trek did it in such and such classic episode and it ruled. It's a third act crutch to add more tension to the movie after the heroes have basically won. Ships have self-destruct options because the captain may not want the ship to be captured and used by their enemies. Even if this weren't the case, it's still a kid's movie, bud. If the ship is self-destructing, why are doors closing? What possible practical purpose could that serve? To trap people on the ship? Like I said, the purpose of a self-destruct option is to screw over any enemy who has captured your ship. The only reason he wouldn't be here is if he was dead. <laughs> or late. No way he could have heard that, but I guess cartoon? Yes, correct. But why did you add a sin for it? That doesn't make sense. Sectosaurus, you're alive! <laughs> And you're a butterfly. I'm guessing Insectosaurus was expensive to animate, because he was pretty worthless for the most part. He changes into a moth to ex machina yet another situation, but everywhere else he either was ineffective, or they found ways not to include him, or they just didn't bother putting him in the scene. What? He fought the robot and made a huge difference in that battle, then saved them all here. What are you talking about? Both of those things were very important. Also, that's the second misuse of the term deus ex machina in this video. <laughs> <coughs> These women may not know what a cloaca is yet, but they certainly look overly eager to find out. Jeremy makes a cringy sexual joke that isn't funny cliche. Monsters, I'm so proud of you I could cry if I hadn't lost my tear ducts in the war. Well, I'm glad this character didn't turn out to be the movie's secondary villain. What the f*** was this character about? It gave him the name W.R. Monger. Maybe this was expert misdirection by a movie that has an ass identification gag and a code brown poop gag. I'm conflicted. He's a satirical take on a tough guy general. What's the issue? The fact that you were too stupid to get that? Jesus, when you can't even comprehend a kid's movie, you should really be seeking some help. Seems a snail fell into a French nuclear reactor. Movie sets up a surefire sequel, but what happened? This movie made nearly 381 million worldwide, was 11th place domestically in 2009, and cost 175 million dollars. Jesus, how did they spend it on? Did Reese Witherspoon demand a giant wardrobe to method voice her character? Everything wrong with Monsters vs. Aliens, ladies and gentlemen. The movie had a big budget. Bears on the move. Wait. So that's how you want to play it? Eat lead, alien ruby. 